Michigan. I'm from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, I'm a college student, and from what I understand of your position, you probably don't support federal student aid. And if you become president, I'm in the middle of my education, and my father was laid off for two years. My parents can't help me pay for school. I live in Wisconsin. I go to school in Wisconsin. Governor Walker isn't going to extend federal or state aid for college. How am I going to pay off my debts if I can't finish my education? Do you well, I, I, in many ways, addressed, addressed that, the problem of the debt. And uh, you've been sort of sucked into the system, so you're getting an education, the educational quality has gone down, and now you don't get a job, so you're in a box. And uh, the big reason that you needed a loan and you were enticed to take this tempting temptation that the do-gooders offered, you say, yeah, I have to do it because the costs are too high, I can't do it. But the costs are too high because people printed the money. And they sent money into education, so they built up the salaries and the buildings and everything else that wouldn't have happened, so the costs are much higher. Now, I went to school um, in the 50s, uh, and uh, both college and medical school, and um, the, the costs were so different. And, you know, I had four jobs. I worked all summer. I had two or three jobs uh, during the school year, and uh, but my tuition was only three hundred dollars a semester, and that was the market tuition. But so now your tuition into the thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's an economic problem. But no, uh, I would stick to my guns on this. That there's no authority for you to get benefit from somebody who's in a labor union who doesn't get to go to college and he has to help pay you to go to college. I think that's bad. also very sympathetic to the problems because uh, we have enticed you to do it. The government offered, offered too much and I would work hard just as I said that I would have priorities uh, like uh, as child health care and the elderly dependent and, and try to work it out because your loan uh, was given at a lower rate and uh, you got money because the government guaranteed <coughs> So the government is involved in that, and I think the government then would have an opportunity to maybe give, give you a reprieve and try to work out. But the most important thing that can help you is a healthy economy and a good job. That's what we need. My name is Margaret Paul, and I hope we're related. <laughs> Um, I may be the oldest person here. I'm going on my 89th birthday. <laughs> my concern is that after working hard all my life, I've been a school teacher, I've done a lot of volunteer work, and I am winding down with my savings. And I'm going to be, I think, in my 90s, reliant. As the, the, the ironic thing is, the better care you take of yourself and try not to be on the system uh, and be healthy, then you live longer. <laughs> and now I'm, I think I'm going to be running out of funds if I get into my 90s. And I'm wondering what you see as a vision for some of these senior programs now. I, I think it's a, a very important question because uh, technically there's no money in the Social Security Fund. You receive Social Security, right? Uh, over the years I've been concerned about this because I, I could see it coming. And it is the reason that I thought, even though there are better ways to have, have insured your, uh, your uh, retirement, but um, what I have done over the years, I have assumed that when we make a contract, even though it was less than perfect, I said that we should do everything possible to fulfill the contract because you were told if you pay into it, you're going to get some money back. Solving the problem of inflation would be your best, one of the best things we could do because your cost of living is going up and Social Security does not keep up with it. So those on retirement, their standard of living has to go down. <laughs> so uh, what I did over the years to try to protect that was I introduced legislation that said these, these monies can't be spent on wars and the general revenue and I wouldn't vote for any of that expenditure because they were taking money out of Social Security. Now my, uh, my proposal to cut, uh, cut back on spending, matter of fact, I would like to see a transition and my suggestion for the transition is not only to help and guarantee your security, 
but I want to offer to the young people who are getting out of college and getting a job that you don't even have to get into Social Security if you don't want to, it's yeah. assume responsibility for yourself. <laughs> But the only way we can preserve the Social Security is by cutting these other fees. If, if, I, uh, if, if nothing gets cut and we keep spending like this, what they will do is your real income is going to continue to run. They'll never stop sending your check. They'll never cut your check, but they will cut the value of your check, and that's happening. I, mean, I don't think there's been a... No cost of living increase for two years, and now there will be a small one now. But they say that uh, there has been no inflation. This year there's a 3% increase, but prices are going up at 9% because the government doesn't always tell us the truth. Did you ever recognize that? They don't tell us the truth about what's really going on. So that would be my idea of doing it, but I, I, I want to make sure that everybody doesn't suffer together. I'm trying to save these programs and work our way out of it by preserving that, those programs. One more question, he says. Uh, my name is Joe Corbin from here from Des Moines. Um, I wanted to get your take on uh, Operation Fast and Furious, and um, if you believe this whole beating the war drum with Iran is kind of a distraction from, you know, with Eric Holder lying under oath and them trying to basically give a chance to um, re, re, you know, restate, you know, under oath, you know, basically give them that other opportunity to, you know, when he obviously lied under oath and just what you take on that. Yeah, so you talk about Fast and Furious where our, our Justice Department and others had this, uh, uh, rogue operation of taking American guns, <coughs> sending them to Mexico so that they can build the case that American gun owners are, are supporting uh, uh, these rogue elements in, in Mexico and, and be a stronger case against your right to own a weapon. And a lot of, lions, uh, a lot of lying was going on and he is under uh, you know, investigation. And it looks like it's rather serious. It'll be interesting to see what happens on that. Daryl Isa, who's running that committee, is a pretty tough person, and I think he uh, he he's going to uh, he's going to pursue it. So I, I think that we're on the right track on that. Uh, exactly what the outcome is going to be, uh, I, I I don't know. So uh, that that's that's one time right now. It seems that uh, the Congress is acting responsibly, uh, but I, I was just wondering. What if we'd have had a Republican president in at the same time? Would we have had the same response? But, but anyway, we won't uh, try to postulate on that. Uh, right now, I see that uh, the Republican House is pursuing that, and hopefully we get to, uh, to the bottom of it and punish the people who broke the law. Thank you very much. I guess if you thought I ran, it's being used as a distraction, you know? Everybody for coming out. Remember, next Saturday, right here in Des Moines, is another opportunity to see Ron Paul live.